So my computer just readjusted my mic settings because it thought I'm speaking too loudly. Which I, I think, you know, technology is great in that way that it compensates for your idiocies. Or your, is, can, can you use the word idiosyncrasies? No, I don't think a technological device can compensate or understand your idiosyncrasies. But it uh, probably has some sort of measurement system, maybe an internal clock, maybe a, a brain of sorts, maybe an internal emotional equalizer saying that, dude, Sandeep, if you speak so loudly, it won't translate well for your listeners. They might find you overbearing, annoying, irritating, loud, obnoxious. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on and on and on. Use all the words that uh, were used to describe my profile on matrimonial.com. Um, I've never been on one of those sites. It was way before my day, young children. Yeah. But I don't know, you know, if I, if I, if I were to create one of those profiles now. Um, I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to gain because you know what? I'm fucking sore at night. But I've been tempted. You know, my, my, my wife and I sometimes are like, should we just create a Tinder profile for each of us just for a laugh? But then immediately my insecurity is like, what the fuck if she gets um, someone really cool? <laughs> and, and then, you know, it's that fucking insecurity, like uh, someone awesome, like... I, I highly unlikely we're looking at the kind of stock out there of men uh highly unlikely she'll find someone better than me uh of course it's not my <laughs> i'm sounding like such a narcissistic piece of shit no but really um i think it's not the you know i i, I don't know sometimes i look at myself um and i can do this now because you know i really had like issues with myself or that's like Ugh, I hate myself. But now I'm just looking at myself in a lighter light. Uh, and and I, I really think besides, okay, you know, maybe the little bit of issues with the eye condition, not being able to do. But I think that's one of the smaller drawbacks. I, have some, I had some other issues which I've addressed. So now I think I'm hot stuff. And this really probably sounds like I'm full of it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really trying to say this from the, from the humblest, uh, from, with the utmost humility. That I really think if I go on, um, because, you know, when you're really trying to look for it, you never find it. Or when you're trying to get it, you never do. So, but you have nothing to lose and you really are comfortable just putting out what you really are. And people use that word now, authentic. And I don't know if I'm authentic, but I'm just like, yeah, this is what I am, dude. Like, yeah. Like right now I have the sniffles. I'm not going to put that up. But like, I know at points I can be um, someone who doesn't listen. I talk too much. Of course, I, I I know it. I do a podcast and I'm aware of the fact that when I'm interviewing people, as you guys might have heard sometimes, and I don't do it to interrupt them or to cut them off or to cut them short or to think that I know more than them. I just get excited because I have a point and I have become um, aware of this and I'm trying to hold off saying, okay, you know what? Don't address this point now because you don't let them finish because that might create an avenue for new conversation and for new ideas. So I do that and I'm aware of my flaws some of them I address, some of them I fuck it. This is what makes me who I am. And I, I think you should apply this to yourself as well. Uh, it, You know, I was just thinking, you know, some people point to the more obvious flaws that people have, whether it's anger, whether it's 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 um, obnoxious behaviors, right? Whether you're overbearing, whether you're rude, whether you're angry, whether you're aggressive, whether you have um, sort of... You, you have habits that are not agreeable with society, right? Whether you, you drink or you do drugs or whether you, you have um, certain things which aren't acceptable. But there are so many other flaws that go under the radar and people just don't talk about it and people live with that. And, uh, you know, overeating or being smelly um, or, 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 you know, with, with being you know, sticky when you, you, you kind of come too close, you don't give people space. There's so many things. I, I, I'm just you know, just thinking off the, off the top of my head, things that are flaws, but not really given too much importance, like someone who might not be, you know, you might might not just be good company uh, for various reasons. I'm, there's not a flaw, but, you know, for various reasons. And I think it's okay to have a fucking few flaws, man. It makes, it, I think you shouldn't just be defined by your highlights and your good traits, but I think you should also be defined by your um, flaws or your uh 
perceived inadequacies, as people might call it. But I think it's totally fine. Some you can work on because you might want to. And if you're in a relationship, your partner, your husband or wife or whatever you call them, I think this new partnership bullshit is just fucking... My partner, my partner, fuck you, man. Just shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just sometimes, you know, if you're living with someone... And they, they are like, dude, you know, it really, you know, every day I'm with you. And every day when you kind of, you know, come and burp in my face with bad breath, it, it's a little irritating. So can you, can you, can you take it easy and just work on that? Cool. But everything do you have to change for that person? No. And similarly, you can live with yourself with flaws that you cannot be proud of, but that's what makes you who you are. And likewise, there are certain things that you can convert from flaws into not flaws. And you can also take some strengths, which, by the way, aren't always good. He's an amazing public speaker. Like, yeah, but don't do it all the fucking time, right? You don't have to do it everywhere you walk around. I don't go into like every, you know, drawing room or puja room or any chowl tree going, ah, you know, all that day. Like, don't hold court everywhere you go. That's also a strength, which is annoying. So a strength can be dialed back and a flaw can be strengthened, I suppose. But anyway, I... As always, uh, went somewhere else with this. But um, I was just thinking, if I'm on these bumblebees or what's it called? Bumble, bumble, bumblebee, a bumble. I, now I shouldn't sound like I'm too old. Like, what is that bumblebee? It, it stings you like Cupid. It puts a prick in your heart. And it puts an arrow in your groin or in your loins. I don't know. But um, <laughs> that'll be a good tagline if the app was called Bumblebee. <laughs> Delivering the prick you need. <laughs> So proud of myself. My first joke in 2022, guys, if you must know. My last possibly as well. Anyhow, so I'm just thinking. I have, uh, I don't have to think too hard to create an uh, alluring profile on these platforms because I don't, I don't, I'm not really looking for anyone, first of all. Um, I'm not really keen on a replacement at this point in time. <laughs> My, 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 I got a lot more mileage on this clock. Uh, by this clock, I mean my, it's, it's, it's a lifetime warranty, guys. Don't worry about it. I'm just playing it light because I am uh, pretty sure my wife will laugh as well. I, she doesn't listen to this podcast, so she has her own podcast. So we kind of sometimes butt heads, but we've been planning to start our own podcast. We're talking about stuff like this, what relationship compromises, things that are important uh, in other relationships uh, that are not just about between the two of you, but your families, your friends, how that interaction happens. So if you guys want to hear that, or you want to hear that, or you want to see that um, come to life and get off the ground, uh, drop me a comment. But you can always say hello, man. I think it's nice, just polite to drop in a message once in a while. Just saying, Sandeep, how are you, fucker? You're doing all right? Uh, the email address is Soapy Rao Show, S-O-A-P-Y-R-A-O-S-H-O-W at gmail.com. So drop in a message, say hello. Of course, if you do catch this on any of these platforms, uh, do send a tweet or a, a tweet tweet or a, an Instagram message, whatever, whatever, whatever floats your boat, whatever suits you, my friend. But uh, as always, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you guys take the time to listen to this podcast because I really enjoy doing it and I really enjoy talking to all the people that I do end up talking to. Uh, today, I've got a great person, Mr. Christopher C. Doyle. That's his um, the name under which he publishes his books and he's got a lot of books out there. We'll talk about those books. You can find them on Audible. Uh, of course, you can find them in the written format, paperback or I don't know if you buy hardback. Um, He'll tell you about, uh, of course, you can just check out his website and that will give you all the information you need. He also has an interactive club where you can talk to him about the ideas that he's working on and he gives you his point of view. Uh, it, it's a very interesting forum. Anyhow, he's an interesting man. But before I get to Christopher, I will tell you about uh, why I think, um, no, I think I don't have anything more to say. But I, yeah, I just think that if you can... Uh, live life uh, it's always easier in hindsight say I couldn't nah, nah, I don't, I, like now if I have to date it's easier or it's to look back going oh you know I had to deal with self-worth issues I think just knowing 
uh, with anything, uh, there are skills that which help with work and there's skills that help with life. So if you can have a few skills that help you with life, you don't have to wait for hindsight to be 2020 20 or clear. You can actually be in that moment and say, you know what, this is what I'm going through. And this is what I perceive as a thing which is happening in my life right now. It may be a good thing or a bad thing, but I don't necessarily have to eradicate it. I'm doing it because this is what um, and where I am presently. And it might help. And I know that, you know, it might not be the best thing for me, but it's something that I have to go through. True. And it might be um, what society calls a vice or a flaw or a bad thing or a good thing. But you know what? It's okay. This is what makes me who I am. And this is my experience called life. And I'm going to live it for whatever it's worth. And I'm not going to do or undo something because someone else told me. But if I think I have to change it, I will do it. And I think if that's the sort of skill that you're able to have and you're able to sort of put in use at that point in time, it's really helpful. You don't have to sit 10 years later going, oh, I know it makes sense. Fucking damn clear it is. Because by then a lot of things might have happened. And of course, this is coming from a person who's <laughs> done that. Or you, I should have done that. So, anyway, you don't have to have history repeating itself or history even happening. But, you know, if you enjoy history, hey, see what a segue there. If you like history, this gentleman loves history. He loves stories and he loves going into the uh, mythological journey of um, India, the past civilizations that resided uh, on this planet, uh, not just India, in, the, in this continent, across the continents, he he's visited some of the best and the most, not best, isn't, I don't think the ancients ever said, mine was a top five, seven wonders. <laughs> Imagine if uh, like um, ancient, ancient earth uh, got talent. <laughs> you have the equivalent of Simon Cowell. Oh, I think that you had some potential with Stonehenge, but what about Stonehenge 2.0? They come next year. X Factor, uh, 5000 BC. E. Hey, but now, of course, there's that joke, right? People are like, BC before Corona. Just slap them. Just slap them because they really have that smugness going, ah, oh, someone, oh, I can freely use this. Oh. Please, you have complete authority granted by me. If anyone does a stupid before COVID, before Corona jokes, you slap them. Anyhow, uh, Christopher C. Doyle, that's his name under which, that's the name under which he publishes. He's got books, Mahabharata Secrets. He'll tell you, he's got a few books. He's got a couple of series out there. And uh, basically, I wanted to talk to Christopher because I really uh, admire people who go into such details uh, for the love of it, for the love of understanding where we came from, where we might go, what that information might um, lead to. And just understanding the, the mystery and the beauty and the fact and the science, of course, there's a lot of all of it. And uh, some of it falls in the realm of history, some falls in the realm of philosophy, some in spirituality, some in learning. And it's, it's, it's such a beautiful idea that it doesn't have to be limited to one particular field of study. But uh, you will hear from Christopher and his passion for the subject that he's done so much research. And there is a lot of fact out there uh, that contributes to where we came from, our history, our lineage, if you want to call it our ancestry, our uh, maybe even the present day situation that we face, maybe the arrogance that we look at our uh, society and civilization with might not be the best thing to do because there are certain signs that there have been and will be more advanced civilizations which uh, didn't, uh, which probably thought like us, which probably were like Mark Zuckerberg going, hey, I will create this thing called Meta. I'm going to take over the world. And suddenly, boom, a meteor hits his Facebook face and uh, yeah Meta doesn't seem that tempting anymore does it now Marky Mark him and Djokovic should probably just sit in a room and you know discuss their issues because clearly they have some anyhow who am I to comment on these guys these are rich big men and I'm just a small little fry anyhow I'm really excited for you guys to listen to the conversation coming up in just a few seconds with Christopher Doyle all the details to his website his books are in the description and of course Straight through, uh, you will probably, uh, not probably, you will enjoy. He's a gentleman who was kind enough to be on the podcast. And Christopher, thank you. And uh, to all of you listening, thank you as well. Uh, I appreciate it. Goodbye. God bless. Cheers. And see you on the other side or on Bumble if I decide to. All right. <laughs> Cheers. Mr. Christopher Doyle, welcome to the Soapy Rao Show. Honestly, it's such a pleasure to have you on, and thank you so much for joining me. 
it's a pleasure to be here sandeep and thank you for inviting me hey no it's it's great that uh we live in a time where i can be on youtube watching something and suddenly a recommendation pops up of uh christopher c doyle at a ted talk and i watch that and i'm like i need this gentleman on the <laughs> podcast so uh first of all i hope everything's well in these times that we continue to live in it seems like 2022 doesn't sort of give us much respite but i uh, hope everything's well and i hope everything's back on track in in its limited ways for you uh yeah pretty much uh, sandeep i think um, i think i'm fortunate to be able to say that fantastic so you do a few things and i think we'll get to all of them because there's some exciting stuff when you, you kind of dabble in the realms of uh, fiction you also look at history you are also involved in a business sense so maybe um i think just to start with where did this fascination with history for you begin like because you've written a lot of best sellers in this space but maybe just your fascination with it just to understand because um you know growing up in indian an indian education system um especially in indian schools i'm not saying indian schools per se but the, the syllabus was kind of boring right <laughs> you kind of aren't really uh, enthralled with the history of india it, it it wasn't told well the stories weren't compelling it was like okay you you kind of underline or highlight this part mug it up and the board exams come you just spew it out onto the paper and you're a great history uh, buff or a great history student when you get good marks but clearly for you you've gone beyond that and your love for it is clearly evident in the the the, the topics you've taken for your fiction so where did that begin for you and how how was that introduced into your life so so first of all i totally agree with you i think the way uh, history has always been taught um at, at least my experience of it uh, is it's pretty dry it is boring mm-hmm. um i think i was probably fortunate to, along the way to have a couple of very very good history teachers who okay who actually brought out um you know um in some you know when you're talking about world history international world history for example they brought out the drama right in world history and there was a lot of drama you know the the whole political drama of of world history and when it was indian history they some of them underlined the things that we don't know mm-hmm. more than the things that we know which is what we are supposed to you don't write about things you don't know in the examinations right yeah yeah you're supposed to write about what you do know but yeah. i or at think, least what the uh, examiner knows <laughs> oh, <I> do. <laughs> so true <laughs> so true <laughs> if you seem to know yeah. more than the examiner oh boy <laughs> that's tough yeah then that becomes tough <laughs> it's a tough one yeah <laughs> yeah so i i so had a couple of uh, very very uh, you know history teachers who made the subject quite interesting and i think uh, that kind of sparked i i have always been a very inquisitive person mm-hmm. uh, as a child i even today i ask a lot of questions um, mm. and uh, i always did and for me it was always you know why what uh, mm. and what is it that we don't know and uh, and i guess um uh, as i grew up uh i wouldn't get all the questions i was the answers i was seeking mm. and i was so full of questions that i just had to do my own research and that kind of reinforce this interest in history yeah so it's uh, you know it's been a kind of a like a snowball it's just been snowballing over the years into uh, into what it is today you know what happens i i think it's such a it's such a vast um sort of pond to look into right the, our, our history is so many years and people are still discovering suddenly you hear a, an article where like oh no no the first the first sentient human being or the human homo sapiens was not 10000 but 50000 years back like it, it like we seem yeah. like the future is uncertain but the past is even more deeper than we sometimes uh, have come to understand but um h- how does someone like you manage to where do you begin i suppose where do you start when um picking a period like because i'm sure you've heard of people like the 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 man who does the podcast called uh, dan carlin's um hard core history podcast where he goes into certain um you know periods in time where he looks at sort of like say the uh, the isle of uh, england and all the various conquering races or say for instance you look at someone else like con eagleden who talks about the romans or you talk about 
the the um, other the empires, right, which was maybe the Spanish or the Portuguese, and then there's there are hundreds of authors, right. But when you're looking at especially uh, history and then throwing in your element of fiction, so maybe just the start point is like, how did you pick what you picked, like the the the, the era, the time, the the even maybe even the genre of history that you you kind of are interested in. So, um, so the history, choosing the historical period or the historical character that, uh, that I'm, I'm going to deal with really comes in at a second stage. Uh, the first stage is, uh, um, is, is the science, uh -huh. uh, because that really underpins. I think if there's one thing that probably, uh, at the cost of sounding immodest, if that's one thing that differentiates the, the kind of books I write, mm -hmm. it's the fact that there's a lot of real science used. So it's not... It's not uh, science fiction where I make up scientific facts. They're real scientific facts. And then I link mm. them to the Mahabharat. Okay, and so that's your main focus, right? The Mahabharat. That's, that's the, yeah, that's the primary focus. So, right. so the, 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 the first step really is um, it starts with, um, okay, um, let's, let's read up on the science. Let's, and mm. I, I do keep, uh, you know, I try and keep myself abreast of all the discoveries that are happening in the scientific world. Yeah. Once I'm able to match the science, the research, the facts to something in the Mahabharat, yeah. uh, then, yeah. then I bring in the history and I say, okay, now, you know, what's going to fit in over here yeah. in a fictional manner? What's going to make sense? What's going to be credible? And where I can kind of justify things. Yeah. And, uh, and then I choose the, history, the historical period of the character. Right, this, 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 you know, this kind of uh, is really amazing because even I, I'm sure you know of authors of like, like Steve Berry or uh, more recently um, uh, this guy Dan Brown who does that, right? Like, but I don't know how much of his is actual fact. But um, you know what, what I find interesting is with um, especially the Mahabharata, right, or Mahabharata, is it's so vast and everyone refers to it, right? Like they're like, now stuff which was there in the Mahabharat said 3,000, 5,000 years back, now Western scientists are discovering it. And, uh, you know, maybe with, with philosophy or with wisdom or whatever the th context they're talking about. And it's so amazing that, you know, that you're bringing it to a person like me who doesn't understand Sanskrit or doesn't know where to look for relevant information. Because of course, in in India till date, you know, like now, of course, yoga has become so mainstream that, you know, every corner has a yoga studio and it's being taught. But when it comes to this kind of wisdom or information, let's call it, let's not go to this thing. It's so easy to be stuck in your own history, your own romantic world of being, you know, delving into the past. How do you bring it to reality? Like, how do you bring something like the Mahabharat, which is very old, very wise, and a lot of people refer to it, but it almost had this sense of, you must not talk about it in public, right? Did you, did you ever feel that? Well, uh, it, it, what you said is very interesting, Sandeep, because when I started writing, um, uh, when my first book was published, for instance, there, uh, I, I don't think there was a lot of, um, um, you know, things were very different from what they are now, mm -hmm. where there's much more talk about ancient India and our, Mm. our heritage and so on and so forth at that point in time uh the epics were the epics and uh, yeah. you know and that was it you had a, you had television serials made on them based on them and and that was it and everyone watched and you know and and had their own their beliefs and their own opinions and so on and so forth yeah so what what i i uh, i found was uh, people liked the perspective that i was bringing in because i was um and and uh, really it was about connecting the past and the present and i was doing that using science yeah because yeah. science was all modern day science uh, at the same time i wasn't making um, you know absurd claims about what was happening in the mahabharata i was using science mm. uh, to question certain the way we looked at certain stories in the mahabharata events in the mahabharata and 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 trying to see if there was some kind of a rational logical explanation behind some of the so-called fantastical things that we read about in the Mahabharata. Mm. You know, the Samudra Manthan, for example, which was the topic of one of my books, was, um, um, you know, we've always heard about it as the churning of the ocean, the Amrit. Mm. And uh, my, uh, my attempt to explain it was to say, okay, you know, maybe there was something that happened in the past. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, today, it's a story. But could science be used in some way to explain it and when when you look at the sanskrit shlokas of 
of the Adipar, where the Samudra Mantan is narrated, yeah. it was very interesting to see that the there were actually glimpses um, of the science that I had researched. Mm. And uh, I don't, I write fiction, so I don't claim that, you know, I'm explaining the Samudra Mantan using science. That's not yeah. what I'm doing. But I'm just saying, okay, why don't we look at it in a different way and see if um, if there is another perspective that we can bring on it. So that's that's how I try and connect the past, which is uh, you know thousands of years old, to what's happening um, to what's happening in the present. Which is, I think, you know, I I think sometimes we forget. I think there's this time where uh, human beings have this very convenient ability to forget, right, the recent past, and suddenly yeah. we think what we are the final. Uh, we are the, you know, as as the youngsters would say, man, as humanity goes, we're the shit, right? <laughs> like, yeah. we have reached the technological advancements that no one has. But I want to ask you a couple of things. I don't know if it's a question, but it's I, I love looking back, right? And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because of I couldn't read books, uh, my mom would read out as much as she could. But now with audio books, I'm just able to I pick up everything from, like, say, the psychology of um, uh, happiness to ancient texts, whichever I can get my hands on. And it's so nice that, you know, people like you are covering uh, Indian mythology and epics from which which haven't been written in a modern day language, you know. So um, I'm really thankful for that. But I want to understand a couple of things like historically, you're the historian here, you've done your research. So are these based on stories to tell future civilizations or future descendants of those people because i don't know where to begin like for instance like you know when you when you look at some people covering the pyramids or when they talk about certain um you know certain images in stone say at machu picchu or say even at at, at various indian sites so now uh, were these people um so, so, so the people the stories are written about were they real people or were they people who these stories were kind of used to manifest, to give examples of what to do, what not to do, and how to pass on information. Um, maybe that's something we can just sort of look at, because is are there physical, real human beings that existed, fought these wars, uh, these lessons were passed on, or was it a metaphor, maybe, for how you should live and pass on this knowledge to future generations? So uh, this is a very interesting question, and, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take some time to answer it because yes, please do. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if I if I ramble, then just uh, no, no, no. I love that. I, this podcast. I should call it the <laughs> Sopi Show, Sopi Rao Rambling Show. I love rambling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I love a good old ramble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you'll enjoy this. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. So, um, so, um, so the way I look at it, uh, Sandeep, is that. The there are a couple of things over here. So first, let me bring in the Mahabharat part of it and get you know and and start with that. The Mahabharat repeatedly claims to be itihasa, mm -hmm. and itihasa does not is a, in a, the Sanskrit word itihasa does not mean history. Um, mm -hmm. It's you know it's a very loose translation if we call it history. But the real meaning, the the, the closest approximation actually is um, this is what happened. So the Mahabharat mm. repeatedly claims to be um, a true record of what actually happened. Now, let me let me park that for a minute. Yeah. Now, I'm not claiming or disclaiming anything over here. I'm just yeah. getting certain facts. This is what You're is just there. reporting what you found out. Yeah, I'm observing. Yeah. I'm observing what the Mahabharata actually says. Yeah. And um, there's been a lot of research that's been done uh, internationally over the last probably 50 years or so, which mm -hmm. is a pretty long time. Yeah. And some very interesting conclusions have been drawn by the researchers who've been doing this research across mythologies uh, across the world, yeah, that uh, every mythology has some shred of history associated with it. Mm -hmm. So there's a kernel of um, truth, if you will, or yeah. you know, historicity to any particular mytho mythological story that you hear about, and mm -hmm. it's been it's then been quoted and embellished as a story, which is then passed down down the ages, maybe to 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 preserve a memory. Um, of something that happened, which may be very boring because history is boring, like we, we just observed, right? Mm. So when you quote it and embellish it, then it becomes easier to remember, especially in oral traditions like ours. Yeah. And I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, you know, uh, to side with this view uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, unfortunately, in India, we don't have, um, we don't have physical evidence for anything that happened thousands of years ago. Um, our, is that because of the oral tradition or is that because it was 
kind of one uh, power that came and destroyed. Like in China, I've heard that the one dynasty that came and that wiped out every sort of succeeding dynasty, wiped out the previous dynasties, um, sort of whatever the heritage or the archives, because they didn't want any of that to remain and be there. Is that something that happened? So again, it's very difficult to say if that happened because there's, there, are no, there are no records. So, it's very <laughs> so <difficult to laughs> they don't really do a job. <laughs> yeah, so, so whatever happened, you know, there's no, so it could be the oral tradition. It could be this, you know, the explanation that you, uh, you're looking at. And um, the other thing is that because of the nature of, our, of the land that India is, mm. uh, all the construction that was done thousands of years ago was typically done with wood. So, mm. So when Ashoka's palace, for example, or the, the bare remains of the palace were discovered, it was pretty obvious it was wood. What mm. was left was the stone, you know, the bits of stone that were there. You right. go a bit further back in time to, you know, the, the 6th century BC, when you have the age of uh, Bimbisara, Ajat Shatru, you know, and, and you look at that age, and then you, have, you see that, uh, which is the cusp of the historical age. That's when mm. you just about start getting written records Mm. Of, of what was happening then and you have not, practically nothing left even there so you know, we're talking about 2600 2500 years ago is the maximum limit of physical uh, you know architectural records uh, right. whereas oral tradition has been so strong that it's mm. been passed on in places like egypt and machu picchu for example which you've mentioned or if you go to the uk uh, Stonehenge and the Orkney Islands and other places which I've explored in my books, there is physical evidence because they built in stone, again, because of the nature of the uh, the land. And therefore, you have the Great Pyramid, which is, um, you know, uh, which is uh, supposed to be uh, 4,500 years old and possibly older. You don't have anything 4,500 years old in India, you know, from an architectural perspective. No monument has survived that long, mm. possibly because they were built of wood and not stone. So, um, the reason why I'm saying all this is that when you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together and you approach this from a global perspective, rather than a narrow, uh, you know, okay, let's look at India or let's look at, Egypt yeah. or let's look at yeah. South America, then you start realizing that, you know, uh, there's 4,000, 5,000, uh, if you go to Turkey, Gobekli Tepe, which I've talked about in one of my TED Talks, um, it, there is a, a fair amount of consensus that Gobekli Tepe in Turkey was was probably the first discovered um, artifact of high civilization, and that's about twelve thousand years old. What exactly so, is the artifact? It's a. It's actually a huge area. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is uh, is refers to a mound, and uh, in in Turkey, and uh, I think only ten percent of it has been excavated since nineteen ninety four, mm -hmm. um, and it consists of uh, layer upon layer of stone circles. So like Stonehenge, except Stonehenge is very primitive compared to Gobekli Tepe because uh, the Gobekli Tepe has these shaped stones. Stonehenge is just, you know, stones which have been cut and placed. Yeah. Gobekli Tepe has T-shaped stones which with carvings on them. Um, it's also astronomically aligned. And now when you, when you think that we are talking about a 12,000 year old monument, which is astronomically aligned and... Uh, was built in an age when we were traditionally thought to be hunter gatherers. Yeah. Then you start realizing there was something happening in the past, which we mm. seem to have forgotten, or we just don't know about for, for whatever reason. And yeah. again, Gobekli Tepe is rare because it's one of those, um, uh, you know, places where very strangely, the builders would build one level and then cover it up with mud and then build the next level on top and then again cover it up with mud. So they, you know, you don't know why they built it in the first place because they kept covering it up. So you have all this engineering that's gone into this and all you're doing is building something on top of it after, you know, so. Yeah. so and this is Sounds a lot like uh, our Bangalore roadworks. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> <laughs> Except Gobekli Tepe has survived for 12,000 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think this has survived even 12 minutes. Like the way... <laughs> I mean, so you live in Bombay, right? So I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the uh, so I guess you know I'm uh, like I said I'm rambling, but when you start putting all, all these things together, you, you start piecing these things together, you begin to realize that there was something happening um, thousands of years ago, which we 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 don't remember. We have we we've kind of forgotten, and and you have this this uh, epic, the Mahabharat, which is boldly claiming. Uh, to be itihasa, to be uh, 
a, a factual record of what happened. You have academics saying, yeah, something did happen in the past and mythology captures that. And when, when I started looking at all of these things, it, it, it was like, um, you know, almost like these people were there. Mm -hmm. Coming back to your original question, that there were people who did some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there could be exaggerations because in the Mahabharata itself, when you look at uh, the explanations that they give, you know, they say, for example, they say that there were there were 18 Akshahinis. Akshahinis mm -hmm. are those are the military formations, and they actually give numbers for each of them. Mm -hmm. And when you add up the number of soldiers that they had, and then you look at the when the description of the war happens, which is when the hyperbole starts. You yeah. know, when they say thousands and millions of people were killed, when 18 Akshahinis would not, never had have that many people. Yeah, but yeah. so obviously that's a poetic license and exaggeration to demonstrate the, you know, how devastating the yeah. war was. The but, magnitude yeah. of battle and the kind of the, 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 it's a good story. Yeah. it's a story <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, um, summarizing all of this, I guess um, I think you know, and, and this is an opinion which I'm stating based on all the research I've done. I think there was something happening in 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 um. Uh, whether you say 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, I believe that there were people like us who, who, had, um, who had knowledge, who had information. I like to think, and this is speculation, but this is something I like to think that, uh, again, based on, on um, Indian tradition, like the Mahabharata or the Ramayana or, or the Purans, any of our ancient texts, that people in those days were possibly more nature friendly. Mm -hmm. So 3,000 years from now, you'll have uh, archaeologists digging up our civilization and saying, hey, these guys were, were dirty people. They polluted, you know, uh, they had this thing called... They didn't the live in harmony with the planet. Yeah. They kind they of... They didn't live in harmony with the planet. Yeah. Whereas um, there are hints again, and, and, and a lot depends on how much you want to believe. But mm. uh, if, like me, you believe that there's a kernel of truth somewhere, then I think it's worth speculating. Were, were they so close to nature that they were able to harness nature for their own purpose um, yeah with the great pyramid for example i've talked about it having resonant uh, it uses yes about the uh, is this the one where they almost act like um, massive uh, generators for the planet through some under um, un under terrestrial link yes there's a theory yes exactly there's a theory about that but it is a fact that the that the resonant frequency of the Great Pyramid, uh, you know, again, there is, there's a golden ratio involved over there mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, it's not stuff that they should have known 4,500 years ago. If you go back- According to, the, to our understanding of them, right? Exactly. The right. way we are taught history. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were, we were just about getting civilized at that point in time. What we, what we know about, you know, uh, the, the pre resonant frequency, uh, the natural frequency of the earth, for example. Yeah. We we would we shouldn't be knowing uh, stuff like that. So in the same way, in the Mahabharat, you look at all the celestial weapons that are being talked about. They are yeah. all based on a force of nature. They are the Surya, Vayu, you know, Jal. Yeah. They are all based on forces of nature. So one wonders that you know. Again, I've said this in one of my books. Um, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Mm. So yeah. just because we don't find. Uh, traces of, of a civilization that existed, say, 5,000 or 10,000 years ago, doesn't mean it wasn't there. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is an, is an example. It was discovered only in 1994. Before that, we thought Egypt, the Indus Valley, and Sumeria were yeah. where civilization started. And that was just about 6,000 years ago. Now it's 12,000 years ago. We've doubled our you know, pushback time by another <laughs> yeah. 6,000 years. You know, and said, oh, even human civilization started much earlier. And then so, we still end up fighting about stuff which is five years old, right? <laughs> so, yeah, <we're> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess you know, like I said, I've rambled, uh, and I hope you like that. <laughs> no, I really, I, I, you know, it's it's sort of as I said, it it brings up a lot of things because I'm very interested to understand uh, what. Uh, you know, because what, what tends to happen is in today's context, if you want to take it in today's mold of looking at the past, we use it to divide um, uh, opinions. We use it to divide people. We use it to sort of put in context of religion and say, no, no, we are a more superior group because of our ancient knowledge, our learning. We've passed on. We are um, we are a more uh, significant tribe on this planet and you should thank us for what we passed on. It becomes much more petty, the conversation, right? And from what you're telling me, when you research stuff like this, when you go back 
you know, past 5,000 years back, it's kind of humbling to understand that, wait a second, you're just a person. I mean, I'm saying you as you and I in this particular society we live in today in 2022, it's just a speck in the scheme of things. And when we visit the past and in all its, it's all its kind of uh, uncertainty and all its, its, its sort of mysticism, we understand like how little we know and how uh, inconsequential we are in the scheme of the planet's history. But I, I want to understand what, I mean, for you as a person who researches all, mm -hmm. all these, all these texts and all these um, various sort of archaeological developments and all these past, uh, maybe the, the past glory of human beings, um, and and how in some sense we don't look at it as an Indian history or Greek history or Roman history, but more of a human experience, a human history. And it's so powerful, yet when you come back to today and you're kind of like you kind of get out of this, uh, of the literature you're immersed in, and you look at the squabbling that's happening, it must be quite frustrating, right? It, 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 actually, it actually is, because I think, um, again, you know, it's probably the kind of amnesia that's made us forget um, the traditions of what happened in the past. But I right. think we've also kind of forgotten that we were, you know, we are one race the human race is one despite yeah. all differences and for some reason we tend to emphasize our differences more than our similarities mm. and uh, i've never understood that because it I, i've always thought that we as humans we've advanced um we've made progress and and we've developed only when we leverage each other's strengths that's how human society actually started yeah uh, and and therefore what how does it how do we gain by emphasizing differences it it it's, it just doesn't make sense you know, what, what is what is your you know take on this like th this this idea you know we have these various um you know the same human species has sort of branched out from say some people say africa and formed these various tribes as we know them today uh, but say something like the lost city of Atlantis, or look at something like Pompeii buried under the volcano. I mean, I, I, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm going to clearly say this is my limited knowledge from reading books. I'm not a historian, so I don't know my dates. I don't know any of those. That's one thing about history. I could never remember the dates. I'm just suddenly, if you ask me, I'm like, yeah, Pompeii and, you know, uh, Game of Thrones happened next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly, I'm cutting across eons and uh, thousands of right. years. But what yeah. I want to understand is, um, you know, this is again, I'm going to put this question from a point of view as a, of a layman, is when you look at Atlantis, you look at, as you said, you know, maybe even in the, in, in the Ramayana, the, 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 the floating ship that Ravan uh, uses, right? It's called Pushpaka, I forget the name, Push, um, Pushpaka Viman? Yeah. Is that the one? Right? So, so these are things which are quite, even if by stretch of the imagination for someone, say, if you, in our understanding of that history, we're like, oh yeah, these are just people who, uh, you know, they couldn't even domesticate um, livestock. And now they're writing about flying in the sky. So there are some theories that this was passed on by, um, you know, I would call it maybe intelligent sentient beings that visited planet Earth, gave us the technology, the know-how to build the pyramids, to put these massive stone structures together. Because if you look at it, we, according to our knowledge back then, we didn't have pulley systems, we didn't have engineering, hydraulics, any of those things which are used to build such large scale structures. So from I, I don't know if you want to say as, as as a researcher, but just from your point of view, like, did we or do you believe that we have um, sort of this planet to call home or have we come from somewhere? I'm just interested to know this is completely um, non, I don't want uh, you to sort of say a scientific answer, but just from what your your uh, time spent in this field, uh, what, what do you, what's your speculation if you want to say? So I... I, I think there's still so much we don't know about uh, about our past as as human beings mm -hmm. that it's it's you know drawing conclusions like we you know some some people came from another planet um, and and taught us these things it's a uh, it's logical yeah uh, I, there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. but the question that there, there are too many questions uh, to raise yeah. there if, if these people did come where are they? Yeah. Why do you stick around? Yeah. I mean, so there's there's this theory in the, you know written uh, by a Western author called Zachariah Sitchin who who talks about planet X Neburu. I think he calls it. He relates it to Sumeria. <clears throat> Is this the the person who wrote the thirteenth uh, planet? No, 
Yeah, I, 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 uh, I don't remember the name of the book, but I think we're talking about the same person. Yeah, he, the he should have interpreted Sumerian texts, and and uh, he says that they very clearly say that there was this alien species who came in, they taught us, and they enslaved us. They basically created the human species uh -huh. to serve them. Now, the 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 problem with this is that uh, there are a couple of problems with, with this uh, theory. It's logical, yeah, but. Yeah. A couple of the problems is well, if there was a master species that enslaved us, why did they free us and disappear? It doesn't make sense, right? You you know you don't do that. Yeah. Uh, at the least, they would coexist. Secondly, mm -hmm. we've uh, we've made discoveries um, after he's written these books of other human species like the Denisovans, for example, who were mm -hmm. fairly sophisticated in their knowledge of um, of rudimentary science, but mm -hmm. they were fairly sophisticated for their, I mean, 50,000 years ago, for example, they knew how to drill holes using high-speed drills in stone. And wow. there, there have been artifacts found um, of the Denisovans doing this. So, so we do know that there were other species, and we also know that there are other human species for whom there's been no, uh, you know, fossil remnant that's been found. Uh, like the Denisovans were only discovered in 2009. Before that, we didn't even know that they existed. Was um, that the group that uh, was that the, the 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 tooth they found in a cave in yes. Siberia? That's the one, right? right. Okay. That's the one. Okay. That's the one. And now we have you know uh, DNA genetic technology. So the analysis of their genome indicates that uh, they contain their genome contains the DNA of another human species which is yet to be discovered. We don't know any about them because no bones have been found, uh. but the DNA is there. It doesn't lie. So yeah. so there's a lot to discover still and. So what if what if, if the Denisovans or somebody else, uh, you know, uh, did exist in the past and did have advanced technology? I mean, it's it's for me that would be more plausible. I'm not saying that that's the case. Yeah. But if yeah. someone was to come forward with with that theory and say, you know, I've got some evidence for this, which is yeah. based on this or a logical explanation, I would be more inclined to believe that than this whole alien uh, thing because there are just too many, um, you know. Uh, too yeah. many pieces of the puzzle that don't fit in the whole yeah i think i like i like the sound i mean it's 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 nice and it's romantic uh, and i think it's important I, also in some ways when people are infighting here saying you know india germany russia whatever and so i was saying no 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 one second you're you're nothing you're just you keep having a little infighting uh, there's actually you know planets of us and they're much more advanced you know just to put us in <laughs> in, in in our place but i think this this theory which you you know you said if people put forward saying that we are um Every group that sort of continued to survive on planet Earth is a hybrid, which kind of took the best of another species. That sounds, yeah, it sounds like we've taken, you know, what we needed to survive at this point on uh, in the planet's history, right? Yeah, yeah. And that also yeah, explains some of the uh, the things that, um, uh, you know, when you look at the similarities. Yeah. Um, and, and I can give you examples if we have the time, but of course, uh, yeah, please do. I'd love to. I mean, I, I, this is from a very selfish point of view. I don't know if the listeners this day, but I, I, I'd love to hear a couple of examples if you don't mind. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so uh, let's look at the number seven, for example, uh -huh. um, across different cultures. So the Mongols have the seven old men. I'm not going to get into details, but I'll just, yeah. you know, you'll see the connection. Yeah. In Siberia, you descend to the underworld in seven levels right in india you've got seven levels of padalo right yeah uh, the vogul have the seven sons of god the yakut have seven supreme gods mm. in india we've got the saptarishis right in the rigved we have the seven adityas the mahabharat has a has a different number but in the rigved you have seven adityas and of course seven levels of padalo yeah in mesopotamia you have the Sibet, the sebetu or the seven sages Right. Uh, in the Old Testament, now I'm coming to the Bible, you yeah. have creation happening in seven days. Right. Noah um, had had seven, you know, seven days to construct the ark. Right. right. Joseph had, you know, Jericho fell in seven days. There were seven priests blowing trumpets. On the seventh day, they did, you know, they went around, in, uh, what was it? They they uh, they marched around seven times and, and the walls of Jericho fell. Uh, so, and, and then, you know, uh, so uh, let me not get into details. So this is one example. Yeah. Uh, let's move away from this now and let's come to uh, metrics, metrology in ancient times. Yeah. So yeah. the megalithic yard in in uh, Celtic times, for example, was 32.64 inches. Mm -hmm. Mohenjo-daro, the Indian guz, 
which is approximately the uh, the yard is 33 inches mm -hmm. in sumer you had uh, 50 sushi in one indian gas right okay. greek roman and saxon metrology was based in sumerian uh, metrology and finally if you go to iberia mexico and peru you find that the short yard is 32.5 inches is it coincidence mm -hmm. yeah uh, I've explored the, the similarity between Celtic and Vedic traditions, for example, and I quickly go through it. Um, yeah. In Celtic tradition, you've got the goddess Danu, whose sons were the Tuatha the Danan. In Vedic, you've got Danu, who's the wife of Kashipa, and her sons, the 40 sons, are the Danavs. Hmm. Uh, in Celtic mythology, you've got the, the Dios, who are the shining ones. In, in India, you've got the Devas, who right. are the shining ones. Now, this is very interesting because we, from a, because Western scholars, first started translating the, the Sanskrit texts, mm -hmm. they translated Deva as God. But the, mm. one of the other meanings of Deva is shining one. It's real, right. right? So again, there are similarities. Um, and then if you look at um, other mythological, the flood, the global yeah. flood, you've got the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is Sumerian. You've got Noah, you've got yeah. Manu. Then the last example I'm going to give. Uh, in India, in the Mahabharat, you've got Yudhishthir's final journey, you know, yeah. where people fall, he's followed by the people, then they fall back, and then one by one, the brothers die, and he, he ascends to Swargalok. Yeah. In Iran, you have um, Kai Khosrau's final journey, which is identical. In Israel, you have Enoch's final journey, which is identical. He ascends to heaven, everyone else dies along the way. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico, you've got Quetzalcoatl's final journey. So, you know, I would have stopped there, but I could go yeah. on and on. When you look at all these similarities, you, you, you start asking this question, or at least I started asking this question, can this point to a single point of origin? Yeah. Is this where all of this came from? And also, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the landmass, the shape was different, the connect the yes. connectivity was different, like the land bridges were not uh, submerged because the Ice Age and the, all these various um, uh, natural um, barriers were not there. So do, do you think it was an, a, a common origin that gave, because, I mean, just from in a very basic uh, explanation, like, do you think it was one tribe that had this information that went across the planet or because otherwise, if you're saying these similarities and various things, the, the, the number seven or the flood or these stories, do you think if it did happen simultaneously to different people at the same time across the planet, how did they communicate it, right? Like, I mean, it's interesting to understand how was communication a, 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 a factor back then? Did, did, did they um, have a way of getting information across like how we have it now? Or did this was this the, the guiding story that drove all these people, right? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question, and and um, I don't think there's any answer. So mm. one one would always speculate, but you know, it's if you look at places like the Indus Valley Civilization, where you've got what fifteen hundred to two thousand sites mm. extending all the way from <clears throat> the, from the Indus uh, and the former Saraswati, you know, the Ghagar uh, channel in um, in what is today Pakistan, all yeah. the way to Yamuna. Uh, that's all the that way to where, sorry? All the the way Yamuna to... River. Okay, right. So uh, this is something that a lot of people are not aware of. We still think of the, it as the Indus Valley Civilization. Yeah. Uh, some scholars now call it the Indus Saraswati Civilization. Uh -huh. But uh, you have a lot of Indus sites going all the way to the River Yamuna. So it, it, was, it was from west to east, mm. covering a fairly significant geographical landmass. So that would almost be like the province, the Northwest uh, Frontier Province, right? The Punjab and all that right now. Well, much more than that. It goes much all the more. way to Delhi. So it covers parts of Haryana. You've got places like Raki Gadi, for example, in Haryana, <clears throat> which is part of the Indus Valley Civilization. Right. And uh, and therefore it was, a you know, so we're talking about the, the whole of NCR, mm. uh, you know, the National Capital Region. You've got oh, good Lord. If those people yeah. saw what happened right now. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you told someone from the Indus Valley one day you will be known as Gurgaon, sure well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you told Drona, because Gurgaon is supposed to be Dronacharya's village, right? It's called. Oh, Guru I didn't Gram. know that. Yeah, it's called Guru Gram because it was uh, Guru. The Guru is Drona. Oh, uh, that's the Guru. They okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Guru Gram, the Guru's village. I mean, it's it was Dronacharya. So, um, but but yeah, so so. How did the Indus Valley of Civilization, 
to give it its traditional name. Yeah. How did they maintain consistency in the metrology, in the metrics, the weights and measures they used, yeah. in the size of the bricks that they used? It's consistent across this landmass. How did they communicate that? Mm. They had, they had, must have had some system. We don't know. We don't yeah. know what that system is. So, so we don't it, know anything. There's no, there's no inkling of oh, this it could have been this. Nothing. Just absolute no, blank on that. No. Okay. But but if if someone could do it across a geographical distance like the Indus Valley, uh, why couldn't they do it in other ways? I don't know. Yeah. But that's that's a question that that I'd like to ask. But again, it's 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 all hypothetical because uh, yeah, fortunately, there's no way to either give an answer or disprove any theory. No, but you mentioned something in your talk uh, and. I maybe um, maybe are wrong when I um, you know sort of paraphrase what you said. It's about the Indus Valley, and you talk about the the how it was one of those civilizations which didn't have the grandeur of palaces, and it didn't have all these various um, like a, a, a ruling and a sub subservient class, but it was more like everyone lived a life. And you, you mentioned some figures that were discovered with uh, the yogic poses, right? Right. So can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I found that very interesting. Can, can you tell me a little, because, you know, it's all, okay, just treat, treat this as a little going back in time for Sandeep's history lesson, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> which I didn't enjoy in, in the in the fourth standard or fifth standard, but something maybe you can just sort of sh show some light for people listening as well. But how it was such a democratic, if that's the right word, society, which kind of prospered and why maybe it it, it fizzled out or why they moved away from where they did. So the 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 uh, again there are lots of hypothetical and speculative answers for for all these questions. But mm -hmm. um, what we do know is, uh, and the Indus Valley is not unique in this, that um, it seemed to be um, a fairly egalitarian society. Mm -hmm. You didn't seem to have a ruling elite, and uh, you know when when you look at uh, the typical descriptions of some of the more important Indus Valley sites like Mohenjo-daro or Lothal. Um, or some of the others that were discovered during British times, you again find a Western slant on it. So yeah. you have what's called the citadel. The citadel is where the elites lived. That was upper, the upper part of the city, and then the lower part of the city were the lower, lower classes. Yeah. Uh, so this is a straight lift from the way Europe was at that time. You had the castle at the top of the hill yeah. where the elite lived. And then you had all the commoners outside the city walls and they lived over there. So you so think that's what the perception they applied to this? Correct. Right. So right. the larger, well-built, well-structured parts of the city, they they said, you know, uh, it's, you know, uh, they talked about rituals and priesthood and, and uh, a ruling elite. But it's, um, you know, all the the on the ground evidence points to, like I said, the figurines or whatever. You don't really seem to have uh, uh, an elite group of people who who would be the rulers uh, over mm -hmm. there, and it's not just in India that this has happened. If you look at uh, you know the excavations at Greater Zimbabwe, for example, yeah, which, uh, which is a, a medieval uh, again the European the whole European uh, perspective uh, divided into the citadel. Men lived here, women lived here, citadel. So. It's, it's a pretty common way. The whole of Egypt, the way it was, uh, you know, the, the Great Pyramid, you have the Queen's Chamber and the King's Chamber and so on. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say over here is that um, uh, a lot of assumptions um, uh, are made, and especially in those days at that time when Europe and Western thinking was, uh, you know, it, it prevailed over yeah. everything else. And not much was known about, uh, about India or or the epics. It was we were a very closed country at that time. Yeah, uh, everything was in Sanskrit, uh, and it took the Europeans to come out and start prizing out that wisdom, that information, that knowledge. Um, a lot of things got confounded during that time, and yeah. uh, the whole you know the, the whole name, the Indus Valley, for example. Um, like I said, it's it's now called the Indus Saraswati because mm -hmm. it, there's a belief that the Saraswati did actually exist. And uh, again, this is a very long story. There's a very good book written about it. If you, you know, I don't know if it's an audio book form, but it might be. It's, uh, uh, what's it called? I think it's called On the Trail of the Lost River or something. Okay, so Saraswati, if, I, I, I'm ignorant on this one, but it's it's the, the it, it, it doesn't, they don't, they can't prove its existence. It's a river that existed many thousands of years back. 
Yeah, so it's it's uh, there's 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 been very interesting uh, proof using satellite images mm. to show that a great river did run where the Saraswati was supposed to be in in what is today, you know, uh, around the. Uh, I'm trying to remember where is it in Punjab or is it in pa Pakistan? I'd have to go back and look at my research notes. Okay. But apparently there is a great channel that is still visible over there, which is the remnants of a, an ancient river. Uh, and uh, and it is therefore speculated that this could be the Saraswati that is referred to in the in the Rig Veda as the mighty uh, river Saraswati. So so when you when you look at all of this, um, uh, it's it's really about uh, these people being, you know, uh, very egalitarian, mm -hmm. and therefore when when the move happened, uh, that was your question. You know, what happened to them? It could have been for a variety of reasons. So one major reason could be if there was a Saraswati, for example, and again, there's an if over here. Yeah. If there truly was a Saraswati, and there is a lot of evidence that's been put forward by people, yeah. um, then it could be that the drying up of the Saraswati led, led to an exodus because they yeah. were all on the banks of the river. But yeah. then what happened to the Indus? The Indus is still there. Mm. So why did they move? So I, I, I think in summary, I would find it very difficult to find a single explanation that I'd be satisfied with, which would explain yeah. why they why they actually moved. Why why did they disappear? Why did the civilization disappear? And, you, and as you mentioned earlier on in our conversation, there's no physical record. No one's like documented why we left or why this happened, right? No, and, um, you know, I just on, on that, con, 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 uh, you know, continuing on that thought, from your research, number one, I think, is it's it, a lot of the stuff you read is in Sanskrit and a lot of people claim it, it can't be interpreted exactly into the English language as we know it. So so some issues I'm sure you come up with like, okay, how is this, as you said, right, is, um, many people call it the Mahabharat uh, as a epic, but actually it's it's what actually happened. Also, the word, as you said in Sanskrit, the, can, the interpretation can be uh, different for different uh, contexts. Um, but also, do you see a pattern? Just, I mean, I'm, it's not really a question, but I'm saying the language, but also from your experience researching so many of these various ancient civilizations, is there a certain path that they eventually head down, which ends up not really well for them? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the short answer, I guess, is yes. Um, okay. you, you go anywhere in the world, you go to Bolivia, you know, you go to Mexico, uh, you have all these, you know, uh, Teotihuacan, Tuvanaku, uh, you've got Machu Picchu, you've mm -hmm. got the Egyptian civilizations, you've got the Celts in the US, in the in the UK, yeah. you've got, um, you've got, uh, well, a whole bunch of people in India, you know, uh, over the years. Uh, and um, there's, there's, there does seem to be a point where, you know, they reach the peak, and then there's a, there is a descent. And yeah. many Many cultures actually have, um, so the Celtic, <clears throat> it's very interesting how the Celtic and the Vedic are, uh, are so similar. Yeah. The Irish and Indians, because they also have a four layer structure. Like we have got the four yugs, Satya, ah. Dita, Dwapar, Kali Yug. Ah. They, have the, they have four ages. They've got the gold, silver, bronze, and iron age. Ah. You know, and those are the four ages. And, and again, it's a descent. Yeah. So it's very interesting. We as human beings today in the 21st century, we say we have we have become civilized. Mm. We have grown in you in, know in, in, in our uh, we have developed, whereas our traditions are telling us that we've actually descended rather than ascended. So we've we've lost a lot of what we had in the past. Yeah. So how do we reconcile? This is the question. Yeah. No, which is, I think, a very humbling um, uh, fact to face, right? When you think that you know it all and, oh, this is the pinnacle of achievement, that when you look back and just think like, wait a second, like these, these, these traditions, these, these scientific advancements existed, like something like, you know, we, we, we've lost, uh, some people say, I mean, I don't know, again, I'm not, I'm not a scientist when it comes to, uh, the anatomy, but a lot of people say that, when we were in the wilderness and not civil society, we had much more control over our senses. Like our hearing was 80% better. Our ability to survive as an individual in the wilderness was much higher. But clearly now we've become more comfortable. We've become lazy. We've become more, you know, a sedentary lifestyle. So 
that and but it's easy to sit and go yeah but look at this like uh, with tap of a keyboard i can make you know um a, com a computer follow my instructions and make an elevator go up and down and we think that oh that's amazing which is of course it's amazing but it's it's crazy that these commonalities existed like these similarities between you know who would have thought between ireland and india like you never would have had a joke going an irish man and an indian man walk walk into a bar right like, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i mean it's gone english uh, scottish but never would you have stretched that imagination to go because just the first of all the drinking capacity is so much different <laughs> but i find that my, i know and but Christopher, so you're, you publish under the name of Christopher C. Doyle. That's your, um, uh, the books um, they're published under. So what are you trying and which you've done successfully, of course, I must um, first of all, um, congratulate you on. Uh, what, what do you, what do you try to do through these stories? Is it retell history? Is it to bring history to uh, people's attention? Is it just that, I mean, of course you love it. That I think is the premise from where you begin. Correct me again if I'm wrong, but what is your, approach and who is your audience and what do you want them to get out of your books and, and is there an ulterior motive is it to educate is it to say hey there's an uh, there's a past of ours which is a lot richer than we think so so there are a bunch of questions in here maybe it's not even a question but what what is your motive and your 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 inspiration behind writing these books so to be to be very honest, you know, I'd, I'd love to say, you know, I started off with a very noble thought to yeah. I had a mission when I started writing, and that was to, you know, to create greater awareness to, uh, about our heritage and so on. Sounds very nice, but yeah. to be very honest, I I think I've evolved uh, okay. over the years. It started off with um, a lot of questions about uh, about our past. It mm -hmm. was very narrow when it started off. Although I was reading a lot about international stuff and international sites, and I'd visited mm -hmm. uh, quite a few of them, but there were there were lots of answers available for what was happening around the world. But uh, I I thought that no one really had explored uh, any of the Indian texts from a non-traditional perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, uh, and for me, you know, the the connection of science was 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 one of those things. Yeah. You know, I wanted to know if, if if there's been so much research done about mythology around the world, and there could be a shred of truth, you know, embedded in mythology. How about India? Yeah, what's the truth behind you know behind some of the things that we read about, about the stories that we've heard uh, growing up? And I think that's where it started off. You know, it was an exploration of you know, can I provide the answers? And because there's so little real hard evidence available, I decided to do it through fiction. And say, you know, this is these are the possibilities that I want to explore, and here's how I'm exploring them, mm. and um, and see if I could raise the same questions in in the minds of other people. And it's and at that point in time, it uh, it's it worked because a lot of people, you know, it resonated with a lot of my right. readers, and um, and I really didn't have any audience in mind at that point in time. But what I also discovered um, along the way was that uh, there were a lot of young people who were interested in the stories I was writing. And yeah. when I say young, they are they are as young as eleven or twelve years old, mm. uh, which is why I've I've after that consciously uh, tried to ensure that my my all my books are child friendly because nice. I do want the audience to be as uh, so today I I'm very proud to say that from eleven to eighty five I have readers of that's brilliant of all age groups who read my books no, and I think that's where to it have. Evolved. For those Sorry? kids, it's lucky for those kids to have this, you know, because they'll realize that it's not just the same old syllabus which CBSE, ICSE, or the state board prescribes, but there is more to it, which could easily shape their future, right, in decisions they make. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, it's 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 really touching when I've actually had people come to me and say, uh, you know, I chose uh, science in class twelve because of you. After reading hey, your books, how I cool said, is I that? I want to do this. I, yeah. I've got mails from people saying, how do I become an archaeologist? I've read your books and I want to be an archaeologist. And, I've, and then I put them <laughs> on to archaeologists and say, first, check it out if it's a career you want to go in for. It yeah. no, it's just, the, just the idea that the idea. you've made this an option for them, right? Earlier, they like, ugh, history, you know, just copy the paper. <laughs> like, literally, it was history, yeah. civics was like, ugh. <laughs> like, all of us, like, it is so boring. But True. it's amazing, you know, and... You know, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you have such a vast range of readers. And uh, I want to ask you, you know, this is something I've, uh, in my limited years of reading history and reading historical fiction. And, you know, when you when you say, for instance, like, um, um, you know, 
but my wife and I went to Dublin and they have that place where, you know, I, I've read a couple of books, maybe not so much Celtic, but like say, you know, you read about the War of the Roses or mm. you, you you read about the Tower of London and you, and then you, you're immersed in that story, right? I'm sure you've heard of Connie Gilden and his War of the Roses series um, yeah. where they talk about the Tudors and, and then in my head, it's being narrated in this beautiful uh, voice actors, um, you know, diction, the characters are coming to life and you, you read of uh, Margaret, you read of Henry, and then, then you actually go to, to London and you're like, God, it's, it's so crowded. <laughs> I don't even want to go. It's, well, how much is it to enter the Tower of London? 50 pounds? No way. I'm going to drink beer instead. Right? So I, the, the history yeah. which you read and the history that you face in reality today, I mean, it's obviously countries don't make money from the Acropolis or from the Colosseum. I understand that. But... Um, I mean, of course, for you, it must be even more frustrating, right? When you, when you, when you read and you've done so much research and you know the exact scientific significance of a certain site and you go there and someone's, you know, selling like corn on the cob right over that site. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe, okay, three things. Uh, I, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if um, someone is interested and they want to have some glimpse of our past, maybe in, in India and internationally, maybe three sites that you would recommend which are still accessible, which are still in some way have their beauty preserved or their significance preserved, um, and three books that you would recommend for people like me who are interested to know more. I could, again, it could be about ancient Indian history or world or human history. Uh, so maybe three sites and three books that you would recommend. Three sites in India or anywhere? Anywhere, anywhere you would recommend. Um, okay, so one site in India I would definitely recommend is uh, Elora. The That's the caves, temple. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, spe specifically the Kailashnath uh, temple at, at Elora. It is a masterpiece and I think okay. uh, people should see it. Sorry, is this the cave where they have the candle burning through winter? That's not the I one, right? Know. No, I don't. Okay. I, I don't okay. Really no, there's a cave. I think that maybe that's Kash, that's Kashi. I think where over be, winter yeah. it freezes and the candle flame is still lit when they come back in spring or something. Okay, so but you're saying Kailashnath, the Elora cave. Yeah, okay, so, cool. Yeah, the Kailash Temple at Elora is definitely one that I would I would recommend. Okay. Um, and the uh, another one would be Stonehenge. Okay. And uh, and if someone can can get into one of the there's there. Are, is a limited time period when they they take groups of small groups of people into inside Stonehenge. Otherwise, you're not not allowed to enter Stonehenge. Okay. You can see it from the outside. Oh, but, you mean uh, into the into the circle of stones? Into the circles. Yeah, in, you go within and and you can you know you spend about oh, what an hour inside. Have the you circle. been? Yeah. Yes, I have. And I and have. is there okay? Just this is okay. Sorry for interrupting your next suggestion in sight. But uh, do you feel anything? Is there a vibration yes. and energy? It, there, well, you know, <laughs> you're asking someone who's biased because I've done so much research. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I want your bias answer, of course, because yeah, I don't want someone going, no, no, they're just stones. <laughs> it is, no, it, it's, it's, an, it's an awesome feeling when you get in. It's, it looks very, very different from the inside. Mm. It somehow seems bigger, more imposing from the inside than from the outside. When you see outside, it's a collection of stones. And you know, that, yeah. okay, it's a circular formation of stones. And, and yeah, yeah, that's nice. Wow, how did they do it? Yeah. You know, 4,400 years old, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, you, it's aligned to the equinoxes and so on. And the solstice is fine. All that's great. Very when rational, inside, very, yeah, very logically super sounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But when you go inside, it's suddenly, uh, you know, it feels, at least this was my feeling, it felt, and I'm, I'm actually going to be post posting videos of this in my quest club. I've been promising for a long time, but I haven't done it yet. Mm. Uh, it suddenly feels like it's 100 times bigger mm. on the inside than when you were outside it. It's just That's so much crazy. more imposing. It's very difficult to explain the, you know, the, the kind of feeling. It's like, you know, if you were to go into one of these enormous temples down south, you know, with a yeah. 300 foot gopuram. Yeah. And you stare up and you say, wow, you know, yeah. or if you go to, into a, 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 oh, one of those old churches in Europe, you know, cathedrals, which have these yeah. huge, it's it's like that. It's like you know, for me, the, the the site that sort of had that for me was the Gol Gumbas in Bijapur, and just putting um, my hand on that stone, right? It's yeah. like, man, how many hands have touched this? Like, I mean, what is the story this stone has to tell? You know, like that yeah. must be. I I find that like that sends shivers down my spine. Just like, whoa, it's like five. I mean, I, whatever, even like two hundred years back or five hundred years back or five thousand years back, the same stone has witnessed so many years and centuries and millennia go by. You know. Yeah. I find it if, if that if they could talk, um, that's amazing. So that was that's your second experience, second sight, and the and the third one. 
The second is, yeah, that, that's the second one. And uh, I guess the third one would be um, would be the, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. That's um, the one that's, in Giza. The one in Giza. That would right. be an absolute must. Uh, these would be my three uh, recommendations. If you have to, um, you know, if you have to, if you really want now, to have experience. Now I'll check them out. The temple, the Kashina temple, the uh, Stonehenge and get a, get the inside tour <laughs> and yeah. uh, the pyramid. Okay. And, and three books that people who want to get into the space to understand a little bit more, maybe for recreation, maybe if they are, um, you know, want to take it up a little bit more seriously. Uh, the things that maybe I could also, you know, read. Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the books which started me off on the, on this journey, or, or at least accelerated my, you know, the research I started doing into the Mahabharat at least, mm. um, was a book by um, Akshay Majumdar called, uh, I think it's called uh, uh, Hindu History. Uh -huh. Not to be confused with Wendy Doniger's book, which is a history of the Hindus, if I okay. So you, okay. we shouldn't. Uh, so Akshay Majumdar's book is actually a very. Uh, it was a book ahead of its time. It was published, I think, in 1917. Oh wow! So, okay. Yeah, four years ago, and uh, I chanced upon it uh, years ago in a in a in a library. Um, mm. <clears throat> there was an old battered copy, uh, which I read. Now I believe uh, there are reprints. Uh, I forget okay. which. Publisher, but it's it is available. I'm not sure if it's available in audio form. So okay. Akshay Majumdar was ahead of his times because what he did uh, 104 years ago was take all the ancient epics, mm. uh, 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 it's, well actually both the epics and all the ancient texts. So he mm -hmm. looked at the he went through the Vedas, the Purans, the Upanishads, the and the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, mm -hmm. and he created a timeline of history in India based on names, places, locations over there. Oh, wow. Okay. It's, it is fascinating. So he's actually looked at the, in some ways, at the historicity of, of all of these texts. And placed them in their sort of chronological sort of. And yes, yeah. Right. So he's got, you know, you've got the, the Surya Vanshis and the Chandra Vanshis. He's got the solar lunar dynasties. Yeah. Uh, each king, he's actually allotted dates to them. Now, unfortunately, because of the time he was writing, uh, you know, they didn't have this academic rigor in terms of giving references. I would have loved yeah. to see what he consulted yeah 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 but nevertheless it's you know honestly speaking even i didn't believe too much in references in my university paper that's why i got caught for plagiarism <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what do you mean references i think this is true and they're like no no you need to cite references <laughs> so i like that even mr akshay majumdar believes like me <laughs> yeah <clears throat> no it, it, it's just a fascinating book yeah? and, and 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 yeah if if uh It'll resonate with you without the references, I'm sure. No, definitely. So, a Hindu history. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. And um, what he also done, which was which I found very interesting, was he uh, uh, rather controversially, especially in today's age. But just imagine, he did this 104 years ago. He basically yeah. said that all the devs, um, <clears throat> the so-called gods, were human. Ooh, so he, that's... in some ways, yeah. This is 1917. So he says Durga was a general. The devs were a race. Yeah. And the others were a race. And there was a war between the two races. So it's like two tribes fighting. Yeah. And Shiva, who was Rudra, was a general. So was Durga. And because of Durga's ferocity, she was given the name of Kavi. Ah. And the demon that she killed, you know, the Asur that she killed was uh, was basically, uh, he was he was a human like us. So it's mm. actually fascinating how he's he's actually done this whole thing 104 years ago. Um, he probably wouldn't be writing this book today, but um, it's, Sadly, it's, I, yeah. I found it very, very interesting when I when I read this book. So that's one book I would recommend. Another book I would recommend is um, so I would I, these are two books by the same author, uh, Graham Hancock. And yes, I would say this... you read either one of them, either Fingerprints of the Gods or Magicians of the Gods. Okay, so you, okay, right? Yeah, so they're they're both on the same topic. In there's a bit of an overlap between the two of them. Yeah. Um, Magicians of the Gods is a more recent book. I think it came out in 2016. Uh, Fingerprints right. of the Gods is came out in 1995. But it was. Yeah, I think there's a lot of editions. I think I read. Uh, I read both. And I think right. there's one more he talks about, which is uh, the uh, lost the civilizations which are lost underwater, right? Yes. Uh, underworld. underworld, or I think I forget the name. Yes. Where, underworld yeah. is another. Yes. Underworld is another book that he's written. Right. Right. Which is which is fascinating. Those are all you know everything that's at the bottom of the ocean, which he's. 
he's explored, including our, way, our very own Dwarka. He actually hmm. was given permission to to dive uh, around Dwarka. Uh, wow. So, yeah. No, I think I've, I've read his stuff. And of course, again, a lot of controversy around his claims. But I think from uh, what, what I've read as well, I really like the way he's sort of takes takes you through time. Um, right. Super. So, so thank yeah. you for the recommendations. And, uh, you know, I was, just, I was just thinking, you know, like we, we, we are remembered or we want to be remembered in the finest light, right? As, as humans or an, even as an individual, you're like, I hope people will need to say good things about me when I'm gone. Or, But mm -hmm. we clearly aren't working towards that <laughs> right, with our actions. <laughs> and I was just thinking, like, you know, we, we go to Dublin, they have the Book of Kells, right? Which is that ancient text. And yeah. I'm just thinking, like, what would be our legacy? The Like, you know, just that same book taken away and you have the Guinness Book of World Records <laughs> <laughs> kept over there. And thousand or two thousand years later, uh, some person going, what does what is, what is this civilization achieve? And it's like uh, 30 cans of Coke in two seconds or something. Like 232 <laughs> tattoos on the face. <laughs> <laughs> I find that quite um, amazingly humbling. But yeah. um, no, I think on behalf of everyone who's listening today uh, and in the future, uh, Christopher, Thank you so much for uh, doing what you do, for falling in love with what you have, with writing about what you've fallen in love with, and for sharing stories which are, um, you know, I think which are timeless at the same time need to be said and need to be written and for entertaining people across ages and um, for, for being here today and sharing, uh, you know, all your learning and, 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 and your research and uh, your perspective on everything you love doing. So thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure speaking to you, and uh, and you know, I think we had I, I enjoyed our conversation. I hope you did too. I thoroughly did, and, and I, I I really loved uh, all the examples and the stories. And uh, if people want to find your books, of course, I'm going to put it down in the description. But if you could just tell them, since they're listening, uh, the, the the titles of your books and where they could buy them, I, I hope they can go get a copy right away and start reading. Besides the books you recommended, which is uh, also great um, literature, but your books, I think, are something they should also go check out. Thank you. So I've, I've got two series. Uh, one is the the Mahabharat Quest series. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> there is the, the the Alexander Secret, the Secret of the Druids, and there's a standalone book called the Mahabharat Secret. They're all available on Amazon mm. and in in all all the bookstores. Uh -huh. um, and there's a, the Patal Prophecy series, which has two books in it so far: the Son of Brigu. And uh, and the Mr. Brahma. So these are the books I've written, and um, uh, there's a new nonfiction series which I've just come out with uh, on my website. So in case people, so this is an exploration of the Mahabharat. It's okay. not a retelling. It's not a translation. It's not stories from the Mahabharat. It is the Mahabharat explained. So mm -hmm. it, we go shlok by shlok and explore the links between the Mahabharat and the other texts. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, and uh, that's available on my website. If uh, if people are interested, they can always go and look for, it's called Reveal the Mysteries of the Mahabharat. Right. And you have an interactive um, a forum with your fans, right? Uh, yes. where, that, that's called the Quest Club? Is that what That's called, called? called the Quest Club. It's uh, The Quest Club is basically free. Um, mm. And uh, anybody who wants, who's interested in, you know, connecting with me, having discussions with me, or uh, I share a lot of my research. Um, on the Quest Club. So if really? anybody's interested, can just go to my website, register for free. It's a self-registration and um, it takes two or three minutes and you're done. Brilliant. And, uh, yeah. and that's it. That's fantastic. Those two series out there. And of course, I'll put the links to your website, the Quest Club and the books in the description and uh, head over and read or listen to Christopher C. Doyle's books. Um, because as you just heard, he's a fantastic human being, great man doing good work. Uh, or a good man doing great work, whichever you choose, Christopher, I'll give you both. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you taking the time and joining me on this podcast. Thank you so much and all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk about something I love. That's the best thing, you know, so thank you so much. Yes, My pleasure. It was great listening to you. All the best. Thank you. Wish you the same. Cheers. <laughs>